just about 9 o'clock here in Chicago. We have a scheduled start time of 9. I'm going to wait just one minute past that to let everyone uh, have a chance to get in here. So we'll just get started in one minute. I'm going to grab myself a glass of water, and we will get started with today's presentation. Just bear with me for one second, guys. Alrighty guys, so let's go right ahead and get started. How is everyone this morning? It is a nice, cool, rather cloudy day here in Chicago. But we're here today to talk about swing trading unusual uh, swing trading options based on unusual options activity. Now, who here has never heard the term unusual options activity before? It's fine in the Florida Keys. I'm sure it is, Ron. I'm very jealous. I'm sure it's quite nice in the Florida Keys right now and most of the time. Um, so who has never heard of this before? And, and a couple of people are saying that they have never heard this term before, are not familiar with this concept. And I would be surprised if any more than just those few that said <clears throat> they're unfamiliar with it have never heard of it before. It's because it's something that's become rather prevalent in financial media and in the conversation around uh, options trading because there's been quite a bit of instances over the past couple of years here where options traders have gotten themselves into some serious trouble trading options with insider information. And that's kind of one part of what we're going to talk about today. And I mean, it's something that really has become quite a bit more prevalent. Uh, you know, Phil Mickelson uh, was in a little, a little bit of trouble for some uh, dicey options trades uh, not that long ago. I mean, there's a lot of uh, this going on. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and jump right into the presentation here. <clears throat> but before we do, I want to read our standard boilerplate risk disclaimer. Day trading, short-term trading, option trading, and future trading are extremely risky undertakings. They generally are not appropriate for someone with limited capital, little or no trading experience, and or low tolerance for risk. Never execute a trade unless you can't afford to and are prepared to lose your entire investment. All trading operations involve serious risks and you can lose your entire investment. No trades, recommendations, or advice. And we can't be sued for losses of capital. All trades are for educational purposes only. Contact your broker or registered investment advisor for execution margin and all other capital requirement questions. Everyone watching this presentation adheres to all disclaimers on optionhacker.com and keenanthemarket.com. So for those of you that don't know who I am, my name is James Romelli. I'm a trader and moderator here at KeenOnTheMarket.com, where I actively trade futures, forex, stocks, commodities, and equity options. But if I were to rank all these, I would probably take the rest off of the page here except for equity options. I rarely trade these other products anymore because I've found that no market can give me the type of edge that the equity options market can when I'm following unusual options activity. But I'm regularly on CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business, and BNN Canada, so it's possible you've seen me on TV. Um, I do these uh, outlets uh, a couple times a week. And if you haven't seen me on TV, it's, maybe you've read something I've written. I write for Futures Magazine, Active Trader Magazine, Resource Investor Magazine, and CME Open Markets Magazine. Now, we kind of go through our presentations the same way every time. First, we want to talk about the philosophy behind the trading plan, why we think it works, <clears throat> then an ex you know examples of what unusual option activity is and how to identify it, and then we're going to go through a plan of how once I've identified that unusual options activity, what do I do? How do I how do I come in and you know click the mouse and make a trade? What 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 do I do to get from point A to point B, which is an actionable trade that I can execute in the equity options market? But the main motivation behind following unusual options activity is to make me more like an institutional trader and less like a retail trader. 90% of active retail traders lose money in the long run, and the average lifespan of a retail trading account, unfortunately, is only 18 months. So that means that 
the average retail trader who decides they're going to come in and actively trade equity options markets, by the time a year and a half has rolled by, more often than not, they will be broke, okay? And that is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing um, to have happen to you. Blowing out your account is awful. So what is it that retail traders seem to struggle with? Why can't they make money? Because institutional traders are doing just fine. Uh, you should you should be uh, able to hear. Everyone should be able to hear. So your brain tells you that your first thing is and retail traders tend to emotionally institutional traders. If you're a retail trader, odds are you're trading your own money. You're not trading some client money. Obviously, if I'm an uh, institutional trader and I make a bad trade and lose a couple million bucks, I probably won't have a job for very long, but it's not my money on the line. So emotions are important, but it's not the only thing that I need to be considering. Paul Tudor Jones once said that the key to trading success is emotional discipline. So he is one of the most successful hedge fund managers around there, one of the best traders in the world, and he says that the key to success is emotional discipline. So do you guys think that that really is what drives his success at this point, that he's just the most emotionally in control guy on Wall Street and that's why his fund makes so much money, that's why he's worth $4.5 billion, that's why he's so successful. So is it really that easy for anyone that wants to be a successful trader? Is it all you have to do, get your emotions in check and trade with an unemotional plan? Well, obviously that's not the only advantage that Paul Tudor Jones has and the main advantage that he has is capital. Capital <clears throat> gives him access to things that we cannot have access to. No matter what we do, we will never be able to get these three things on the level that Paul Tudor Jones and other institutional traders can get them at. Information, technology, and manpower. Higher quality information, whether or not that information is non-public or not. Right? Inside, uh, insider trading doesn't usually happen uh, has re, uh, you know isn't usually committed by retail traders, right? Most real retail traders aren't uh, part of the same country club or uh, social club as you know VPs and CFOs of companies that might be able to give them a little bit of information that is non-public. But <clears throat> think outside of those out there who are breaking the law and committing insider trading, because most hedge funds and institutional traders are not. Most of them are honest people that are just doing their jobs, but they still have better ways to analyze and um, kind of digest that information that they're able to get, right? So they have the technology and they have the manpower to do a higher level of analysis than I can ever hope to. How many hours per week do you guys um, uh, spend doing research outside of market hours. So going over charts, looking at financials, reading articles, learning more about trading, doing anything that you would consider, you know, quote unquote homework outside of regular trading hours during the week. Do you spend five hours? Do you spend two hours? Do you spend ten hours? Just just shout just shout some some numbers out here for me guys. Three hours, four, eight hours. 15 hours, it's kind of a long time, three hours, 10 hours, two, right. So, oh wow, 20. So even for the person who's spending 20 hours a week, which is very impressive, that's far more than I spend outside of um, uh, trading hours, uh, reading financials or reading articles, looking at charts. Even for you, the person who spends 20 hours, let's say you were able to spend twice as much time and you were able to spend another full-time job's worth of time just doing research, 40 hours a week. Well, that doesn't come even close to the amount of time that a desk full of uh, you know, traders with uh, PhDs in math and physics can at a hedge fund, right? 12 analysts are always going to be able to do more work than you can, right? And even if the quality of the work that one individual analyst can do at an institution might not be on par with what you can do, I'm not saying that you know we're, retail traders aren't good at analyzing information and you know consuming um, material uh, relevant info about the stock market, but they just can't do as much as a team of people can. So 
all of these things give them advantages, but what is the end result of all of this analysis and everything that goes through this? So think about this. Information comes in, <clears throat> goes through the hedge fund machine, and it comes out and they say, okay, now we have a trade. So I know that no matter what I do, I can never get access to this stuff on the same level that they can. I can't bring myself to their playing field on this on this level, right? But what I can do is get the end result. If I can identify their trades, well, then it doesn't really matter that I didn't have access to any of this stuff. I, I was able to see what the end result is. I was able to see what the order was, the strategy that they arrived at, and executed in the options market. And this is where we enter into unusual options activity. So unusual options activity is driven by institutional order flow. Institutions are the ones that are behind unusually large options orders. And UOA is considered any type of option order that is above the average daily equity option volume in a stock. And it gives me an insight into institutional order flow and where the quote unquote smart money, or at least the big money, is placing their risk capital in the market at any given time. And it lets me access all of that information without actually having the information, if that makes sense. right? I can see the end result. They come in and they do a trade. Now, this is an ideal way to trade equity options because this, this concept doesn't really work in any other type of market. right? It doesn't really work in futures. It doesn't really work in stocks either. And why is that? Well, to understand why this works best in equity options, uh, we have to understand first the order process that goes down in the equity options market. So an institution is going to create an order, a strategy based on all of their information, research, and analysis that we've already agreed upon uh, is going to be way better than mine, right? It's going to be way better than mine. So then they call their broker to get their order executed, and they'll say, okay, I want you to go buy 10,000 ConAgra July 39 calls for a dollar and ten cents. <clears throat> call me back when you have a fill. So the broker will then call trading desks all around, Citadel, Goldman Sachs, Barclays, uh, J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, Bank of America, small, you know, some of the smaller market-making firms to get this order filled for their customer. If none of those guys want it, then they'll send the order to the trading floor, and the market makers on the floor can trade it. If the market makers in the floor don't want to trade it, then the broker has the choice of one, executing the trade for their customer, hedging it out, and taking on the risk themselves, or two, telling their customer, sorry, no fill. Odds are they're going to execute the order for their customer because they want to keep the business going forward. But what's important to understand is that at no point throughout this process does the broker have the ability to send that order flow off of the exchange to a dark pool. He does not have the ability to do that. All of the order flow in equity options must go through a public exchange like the SIBO or the Philex or any of the other dozen or so equity options exchanges in the country. So what does that mean? That means that no matter what, they are not able to hide their order flow like stock traders are in dark pools. Does anyone not know what dark pools are? I, there's probably a few people that don't know who dark, what dark pools are. So let me just tell you. A dark pool is a center of liquidity that is off of the exchange. It's where institutional traders can trade large blocks of stock with each other without that transaction being represented on a publicly available quote stream. Right? So if I want to sell a million shares um, of Apple, and I don't want it to show up on the publicly listed exchanges, so I don't want the traders at the NICE to see my order, I can send it to a dark pool. And most equity volume takes place in dark pools nowadays. <clears throat> Citadel has their uh, headquarters down the street from us here in Chicago. By the time the first hour of trading has rolled by, Citadel will have traded more equities in their dark pool then the New York Stock Exchange will trade all day. So this concept doesn't really work in the stock market, but it works perfectly in the equity options market. Uh, yes, this will this will be recorded. This will be recorded. 
and we're going to talk about how to determine if uh, if orders are opening or closing um, uh, in, in a little bit later on here, Eddie. So you'll be able to you'll be able to well, we're going to cover that. Trust me. <clears throat> okay. So I know that these trades are based on valuable information, perhaps insider information. So I want to be able to follow them. I want to be able to see what they're doing. So even if I'm someone who's not an options trader. I can benefit from following unusual options activity because it's the only place I can get a clear view of what the institutions are trying to do. I can't follow order flow in the stock market to, to make those determinations. I can't follow it in the futures market. It has to be in equity options. It lets me see where all of the capital is going and where all of the large risk capital is being placed by these institutions. So what do these orders look like? And there's a way to look for them in Thinkorswim, and there's several uh, services out there that um, search for these things. Uh, we use a scanner called Trade Alert. We also have a scanner of our own called Option Hacker that we built. There's one called Option Flux. There's Sizzle Index in Thinkorswim. So there's a lot of different ways to get this information. But this is what it looks like when it comes across our scanner. And what we see here is a ton of information inside of one little alert here. We see the time the trade took place at, whether it was bought or sold, the size of the trade, the stock, the expiration, the strike price, whether it was a call or a put, the price the contract traded at, the bid and offer at the time of the trade, whether it was an opening or closing position, and where the stock was trading when the option trade took place. So there's a lot of information here. And the first thing that I can see is that, hey, they came in and bought 5,000 of these CAG <clears throat> July 39 calls for a dollar and eight cents so right away I know that this is an institutional trade right away why because this is a five hundred and forty thousand dollar bet that they're placing on con agra options all right <clears throat> I can also see that they paid a dollar a dollar and eight cents when the market was 90 cents at 105 so they paid through the best offer meaning that this was an aggressive aggressive buy of these options. This trader wanted to get filled on this order and they were willing to pay more than what the best offer in the market was to get their entire order filled. I can also see that they're um, doing this as an opening position. Now all trades technically should be labeled opening by the broker. Some exchanges don't have the ability to tag these orders as opening so sometimes that gets lost. But there is still a way for me to figure out if a trade is an opening position or a closing position. There's a, still a way for me to figure out. So someone says, why wouldn't this have just filled at the ask? Well, look, there was only 387 contracts at the ask, and they wanted to get 5,000. The market was 90 cents at 105, 837 by 387. So if they wanted to get filled on all 5,000, they're going to they're gonna pay through the offer. Right, that's what a sweep is. They swept out all of these bids or all of these offers. So they bought all 387 of these contracts at 105, and then paid more for the rest. Makes sense. <clears throat> so if you take a look at ConAgra, you can see that it doesn't actually, yeah, it doesn't actually trade in uh, pennies. So when they get filled at 108, that means that they got filled at multiple prices. Does that make sense? And you can see here, this multi-tag tells me that they were filled at multiple exchanges. So they got filled at more than one exchange because they, they had to buy everything that was there. They had to buy the entire size of the market at the time to get filled. <clears throat> Make sense? So once I see this information, how do I determine whether or not this is an actionable trade setup? Well, for one, I know that it's a large bet right away, so I know that it's probably something that's rather interesting to me, okay? So I go in and I, and I take a look, and I do a little bit of analysis. Well, this trade hit the tape shortly after the open on Tuesday. ConAgra ripped higher after these calls hit the tape, and this trader saw a huge profit in a matter of minutes okay in a matter of minutes conagra is a stock that i've seen uh trade well on unusual option activity before so i knew that it was going to be an interesting order so let's take a look at how the stock traded after the order hit the tape well conagra ripped higher after those calls were bought they were bought in this bar when stock was 38.29 so somewhere like you know right right around here 
and the stock ripped higher, touching new highs, selling off a little bit, but then rallying uh, into the close again, right? Big, big move higher in ConAgra. As a day trader, I would have been able to capture some enormous profits in this trade. These calls traded as high as $1.70 in Tuesday's session, meaning that this trade was an absolute blowout winner. If I would have bought a 20 lot of those calls, I would have profited $1,240 on $2,160 worth of risk just in one day. That's 57% profits inside an hour's worth of time. Can I ever get a return like that day trading stock? Can I ever get a return like that day trading stock, guys? Is it possible? No, it's not. Well, these trades come across instantly. They come across as soon as they take place. But what has happened since then in ConAgra? Well, interestingly enough, on Thursday after the bell, um, the announcement was made that Jana Partners was taking a big, big stake in ConAgra. And what happened? The stock gapped higher again on this news and traded as high as 4362 in Friday's session. What happened to these calls? Look at this. They tried it, traded as high as $4.57. $4.57 after they were bought for $1.08 on Tuesday. So how much money did this trader make on this trade? What were they able to capture in profit? Well, they made $1.75 million dollars by the end of the week. So let me ask you guys this. Looking at the way that the stock traded this week and the fact that it ripped higher on an announcement on news on Thursday and into Friday session, do you guys think that it, this trader in ConAgra got lucky? Do you, th do you think that he was just lucky that that happened? Was that just blind luck? Or did he know something that he wasn't supposed to? Or maybe not, maybe not something that he wasn't supposed to, but did he make a trade that he wasn't supposed to? Did he have some kind of insider information? Right. It seems fairly obvious that he knew something here. Now, what does that mean for us as options traders? Well, it means that we can identify orders like this in ConAgra as suspicious, follow these orders, and benefit from his wrongdoing. And, you know, I don't have any problem with doing that. If the, um, someone says, uh, one question, why didn't he invest more than a half a million dollars in this trade? If he's a multi-billion dollar fund, he can put $10 million into buying these calls. Right, so here's the thing. Equity options are very, very risky. And if he did make this trade on it using insider information, which it seems very likely that he did, right? There's kind of like a happy medium of, I want to make as much money as I can, but I also don't want to go to jail, right? So he can't come in and, you know, make a hundred million bucks in this trade without getting noticed instantly by the SEC, right? He can't do that. You know, under, you know, around a few million, it's a lot less likely that he gets caught, right? And it's you see this happen all the time. See, the SEC has a really big backlog of these cases. And <clears throat> by the time, um, you know, they get to this, and we're talking years and years and years, by the time they get to investigating what happened in this announcement, this particular situation, if so much time will have passed that, you know, talking about who knew what, when, and what happened is going to be really difficult for them to do. Let's say that this trader put $20 million into this trade and profited $100 million bucks on the transaction. Well, then he kind of jumps up to the front of the list. Um, he kind of jumps up into the front of the list here as uh, something that they want to look into right away, right? So do we uh, capture closing trades? Yeah, so it's, we're going to talk about how you can catch the closing trades as well to see if they get out of their position. What's interesting is that he still hasn't yet. He still hasn't. If we look at the open interest, this trade is still open. This trader has not gotten out of the position yet. There's, they've sold some on Friday, but they did not get out of all the position. Okay, so how often does this happen? And this is kind of the other side of unusual options activity because we think that 
it's worth following these really big order flow. This re these really big orders. Yeah, you can you can search for uh, unusual activity in Thinkorswim. You just can't do it in real time. This service spits it out in real time. But what we're going to talk about here, we're going to talk about examples that take a little bit more uh, analysis and planning. So you don't really need to have that info in real time. You can get it in Thinkorswim on the on more of a, like a delayed feed, and you're still okay. So how often does this happen? Well, <clears throat> take a look at this. On March 10th, a trader bought 10,000 craft June 67 half calls for 70 cents. They traded as high as 22.70 since then, meaning that this trader made 22 million dollars in this trade on a $700,000 bet. Well, they were bought in March. It was one of the largest trades we've seen in craft in the last year. And then the announcement was made that Kraft and Heinz would merge, Kraft would pay a huge special dividend to its shareholders, and that they were going to become one of the largest food companies in the world. Now, again, I ask you the same question. In this situation, do you think this trader got lucky, or do you think he knew something? Did he get lucky, or do you think, he knew, do you think that he knew something? Right? Again, it seems fairly obvious that this trader knew something. Some of the, Eddie says, "I got lucky. I was in a call traded when this announcement came out." Yeah, and here's the thing: a lot of our a lot of our traders were in calls in Craft as well when this trade came out because we were flagging unusual option activity in Craft for a month before the announcement was made. Okay, so auditing for American greed. Yeah, so take a look at this. And ask yourself, why do we care about following unusual options activity? And there's really two sides to it, right? The first side is this. Those with more capital have better access, better um, analysis methods, more people to do work for them and arrive at good trading ideas, okay? They execute trades with no insider information. They don't cheat. They're playing by the rules, right? And then there's the other side of the market, right? The guys out there who do have insider information are executing trades based on that insider information. They create unusual option activity as well. Well, I care about both. I care about both trades, right? I think both are valid. I'm not going to get a trade like that in Kraft or CAG every time. It doesn't happen that way. But a study was written about oh, 18 months ago, about a year and a half ago, and Andrew Ross Sorkin reported on this study relatively uh, heavily for a while. It was all the talk on CNBC and Bloomberg and Fox Business for a long time. That said, ahead of merger and acquisitions deals, and if we go back you know, since options have existed and look at merger and acquisition deals and looked at order flow ahead of it, 25 to 30 percent of the time there was some type of unusual activity like we saw here in Kraft, like we saw there in ConAgra. 25 to 30 percent of the time. So that means that, you know, a third of the time someone is doing something they're not supposed to and there's activity that is easily identifiable as unusual that can lead to profits like this. So you know, I, you might not think that this happens all that often, but in the past two years, I've caught trades like this uh, probably about four or five times, and have seen it happen probably you know 50 times. Right? It happens a lot. It's not the typical return on every single unusual option activity trade, but it does happen a lot. All of these trades that come across are public information. So regardless of what of what the trader who is initiating the position knows, I can follow into the trade using his order flow as a guide, okay? So that's the other side of it, right? It's like being able to see what Carl Icahn, David Einhorn, what these activist guys are doing before they disclose their positions in the stock market, and it's also like being able to see what the insider traders are doing, and when I say insiders, I mean those who have information they're not supposed to, okay? So does this make sense to everybody so far? All of these trades are public information, so there's nothing wrong with trading unusual options activity. Does this all make sense to everyone so far? Before we, We're about to jump into the actual trading plan here, but I want to make sure that you guys are all clear on <clears throat> what unusual option activity is and why we care about following it, why it's important. Yes, 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 yes. 
Okay. So there's different ways to trade unusual option activity. I consider myself a very active, very nimble trader. I'm in front of the screen all day long, so I'm able to get in and out of positions very quickly. I might be in a trade for 10 minutes before I decide to exit the position and get my capital back, right? Not everyone can trade that way. Not everyone wants to trade that way, okay? But the great thing about unusual option activity is that it'll provide setups for every type of trader out there. The day trader, the swing trader, the long-term trader. Because hedge funds, guess what? They do all of that stuff. They do they speculate on where Apple's going to be by the end of the day on Monday. They're going to speculate on where Apple's going to be by the end of the month. They're going to speculate on where it's going to be in three months, six months, nine months, and two years. They make bets across all time frames. So if I want to get a guide for better swing trades, I look for that type of activity in the equity options market. If I want to get a better guide for day trades, well, I'm going to look at very short dated activity. We, unusual activity in weekly options or front month options. And if I want to be more long term with my trades, well, then I'm going to look for activity in the longer dated options that come across. Leaps, January, months into next year, January of 2017. I can see activity across all of those expirations and use it as a guide. Now, I typically don't put too much money into longer term setups. I typically don't do that, right? I, I, I want them. Um, uh, to keep as much dry powder as I can. I don't want to have um, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to have uh, a ton of money tied up and stuff that takes a long time. But some traders prefer those longer term setups. So what do those look like? What do those look like when they come across? So let's take a look at this. This is our unusual options activity trading plan. We call it the Oak Ribbit trading plan. We're going to use it to analyze and determine whether or not an order is actually going to give me an actionable trading idea or setup. So on the 27th of February, a trader came in and bought 150,000 uh, GE January 2017 3035 call spreads for a net debit of 52 cents. Now, this means that they're buying the 30 calls, selling the 35 calls for 52 uh, for a net debit of 52 cents. It costs 52 bucks per one lot for them to get into this trade. Now, we're going to use the Oak Ribbit trading plan to analyze this. And Oak Ribbit is an acronym. I know it's not that eloquent of a uh, of an abbreviation, but please bear with us um, on that. If you have any suggestions for a better uh, name, please email me. I'm all ears. But Right away, I can identify this as institutional order flow. And how can I do that? Well, it's enormous. That's a very easy way to identify institutional order flow. $7.8 million bet. Right? There's not very many traders who are you know, sitting at home in their basement on their laptop or on their desktop slinging $7.8 million chunks of options back and forth that expire in a year and a, a, year and a half. Okay, so as soon as I identify this as institutional order flow, I know that it's interesting, but that's not the only thing that is relevant to me. I need to make sure that this fits up, fits in well with my trading plan. And the first thing that I need to determine is whether or not this is an opening or closing position. I mean, think about that logically, guys. Do you want to buy a position that a hedge fund is closing? No, you want to get in at the same time that they do. So what we do is we check volume versus open interest. All right, this is the easiest way to determine whether or not a position is opening or closing. So if the volume in the trade is larger than open interest, then the order is 100% an opening trade position. If it's smaller than open interest, then I can't determine for sure, and it's more likely that it's closing, and I need to pass on the trade. I can't put any money into this. Right? Think about that logically. If I have open interest of zero, and I see 5,000 calls being bought against zero open interest, well, I know that it has to be opening because there's no open interest for, their, their, uh, for them to close. Likewise, if the open interest is 5,000 and I see 10,000 calls bought, well, it still has to be opening. There's not 10,000 contracts there for them to close. All right, does that make sense to everybody? That's a very, very, very important part of identifying these orders. Because if I see an order that's really big, but it doesn't pass this first step, it doesn't matter. It could be a $40 million bet. If volume is not greater than open interest, I cannot take the trade. Okay? So I only want to take opening orders, and I only want to take orders that have really large volume over open interest because it shows a higher level of conviction. Let me ask you this question. 
let's say I have a uh, trade that is labeled opening, and I see contracts being bought. I see 15,000 calls being bought against 14,000 in open interest. Well, is that trade really as significant as the trade of 10,000 calls being bought against no open interest? No, it's not, right? Is it as significant as 5,000 being bought against no open interest? No, it's not. So the larger volume is relative to open interest, the more significant the order. Now, obviously, with 150,000 contracts, the open interest could be 25,000, and it's I still go, wow, this is huge, right? So right away, this you know GE, this order, passes this first check with flying colors. It's definitely open, and it's definitely a massive, massive, massive trade. Next, I need to determine whether or not the order is a hedge or a speculative bet. And this is kind of the trickiest part of trading and usual options activity because there's two main participants in the equity options market, hedgers and speculators. Hedgers come in and they buy and sell equity options in order to protect themselves against adverse moves in the underlying stock against the position that they have on, right? So when they come in to buy an option, they're buying that option hoping that it goes to zero because if it does, it means that their overall position made money right? <clears throat> the acronym stands for, we're going through open interest, chart, risk, reward, break even time and target. We're going to go through each one, um, ooh, excuse me, individually here. So I need to determine whether or not an order is a hedge or a speculative bet. Okay. And this is where the only kind of really subjective part of the plan comes in and it requires a little bit of discretion, but there is a really great way to do this. And the chart helps me determine whether or not an order is a speculative bet or a hedge because it helps me determine what the underlying trend is. More often than not, the institutional traders are not betting against the underlying trend. They bet with the underlying trend. So if I can identify that trend and match it up with the order flow that I'm seeing, well, then I can, you know, with a, in a best estimation, determine whether or not an order is a speculative bet or a hedge. Okay. So, I can never know for sure, but I still want to use the chart to help determine that. And my main indicator to use for that determination is the Ichimoku cloud. So who's never seen this before? Who's never seen the Ichimoku cloud? Has anyone never seen this? It looks like a mess, I know. But it's actually super easy to read. It's very, very easy to read. And if you take away nothing else from this presentation other than this, take away this one point. The Ichimoku cloud is incredibly easy to use because it gives us this shaded area that we have here. And simply put, and I can spend another three hours talking about the finer points and minutia of the cloud, but I'm not going to. <laughs> simply put, anything that's trading above the cloud is in bullish territory and anything that is below it is in bearish territory. Okay, so what do we see about GE here? We see that after, ooh, that was a, I don't like that drawing. We see here that after earnings, the stock has been on a nice uptrend on the daily bar, and it has broken the cloud to the upside. Breaks of the shaded area indicate a change and further strength and momentum to the upside. So the daily chart is bullish. The stock is breaking the cloud to the upside, but the order itself also tells me that it's probably not a, spe uh, a hedge. It's probably not a hedge, right? Because what would that order be a hedge against? Well, a trader could buy call spreads like that to hedge short stock, but it seems very, very unlikely with the trend in, uh, in GE after earnings that a trader would choose this day to come in and get short stock and buy a hedge that is two years out from now. Because what does that tell me? That tells me that they're planning on being short GE for the next 18 months. Um, does that make, you know, does that make sense? And, and it was way more than 18 months because this order happened in, in like February, right? So, you know, are they going to really come in? and um, try to be short GE for almost two years, right? That's not really the type of trade that you see an institution do. Generally speaking, institutions are long. They, because, I, I, you know, market participants are long. Everyone is long all the time, right? This is very clearly a long-term speculative bet in GE. So once I've identified that as a speculative bet, then it's time to take a trade here. and then I have to do the second half of my analysis to determine whether or not I want to get into this trade. And then once I'm in the trade, manage the trade. So risk, reward, and break even are all tied together. My risk and reward are very, very closely related. So in this trade with GE, um, 
spreads trading for 52 cents, I know that my maximum downside is 52 cents or $52 per one lot, okay? So it's a relatively cheap spread, and that's great because it tells you that even if you have a small account, you can take trades like this, right? 52 bucks per one lot. If you have a account that is, uh, you know, 10,000 bucks, has 10,000 bucks, you can take a 10 lot of those and only risk 5% of your book, right? So I need to determine the risk, and then I need to determine what, you know, size of my book I want to put into this position. Typically speaking, I don't like to put more than 5% of my book in any one position, all right? So if I have a, um, you know, $100,000 account, I can buy 100 of these for $0.52 cents and pretty much stay in line with that total risk amount. And then I need to manage that risk via stop losses. And I personally do not use stop losses, but as a beginner or an kind of a middling um, unusual options activity uh, trader, I would want to use a stop because unfortunately you're not yet quite an expert at identifying an order as a speculative bet or a hedge and, you know, getting into the proper trades. So you don't want to risk too much, but it takes a while to pick, pick up on this, but you'll get to the point where you'll be watching it enough that you'll be, all right, I'm able to identify these right away as a good trade or a not actionable idea. All right. So then I need to make sure that I'm sticking along with the trader's trade, right? I want to trade as closely to the institution as I can. So I want to buy the same spread for as close to the same price as they did, right? Now, a lot of traders who try to trade this way get caught up in this, and it's a really tough way to make money doing this in the long run. But what they do is they come in and they try to tweak the order, right? So we've pretty much established that traders have – these traders have better information and that their order flow is significant for a reason that it has advantages behind it that I can't have. So if they're coming in and putting on a trade in January of 2017, they didn't just randomly pick that expiration. There's a, a reason that they chose that expiration and there's a reason that they chose those strikes. So I could obviously come in and say, hey, you know what? I don't want to spend 52 cents. I'm going to buy the ones that expire in two months and it'll be way cheaper, and then that way when GE moves higher, I'm going to make even more money, right? But that's not the way to go about it. I'm pretty much, you know, completely flying in the face of all of the reasons why I care about this order flow in the first place when I come in and say, you know what, I'm going to tweak this trade. I'm not going to try and trade the order that they did. And then I want to make sure that I keep an eye on the position and typically the order, and most importantly, the order flow in those options so I can know whether or not the uh, trader is exiting their position, right? Because when they get out, then I want to get out too. So I also want to put out profit targets right away. So I determine those at the beginning of the trade. And for a spread like this, I'll be trying to sell half at a double and the rest um, at targets above that. Because we know that this trader with a $5 wide spread is – risking 52 cents to make $4.48, right? So that's $448 per one lot that they're uh, trying to get out of this trade. And 150,000 times, that's a $67 million upside for them, right? And if I buy a, you know, if I buy a 20 lot of these um, trades, it's going to cost me, what, 1040 bucks. And I'm giving myself $8,900 in upside, potential upside. So I really like the trade. It's great. It's a great risk versus reward setup, right? It's a fantastic risk versus reward setup. So take a look at how the stock uh, moved after this order hit the tape. Well, <clears throat> the announcement was made that uh, GE was going to spin. Yes, it, it is recorded. It is recorded, Ramesh. The announcement was made that GE was going to spin off its GE capital division and investors really, really liked that. But take a look at how the trade behaved uh, from the moment that the trader entered until the catalyst event. It kind of, you know, GE sold off. It traded in a sideways range. But what was great about the spread is that it really never lost that much value, right? Because it's so long dated and it's a spread, it never lost that much value. So traders did not take pain who got into this position. And then, boom, the announcement happens. The stock rips higher. What happened to the spread? Well, the spread exploded in value, obviously. Now, this trader saw that spread go to as high as $1.04, so it doubled in value, and it's currently trading around $0.75, cents, which is better than 50% profit in just a few months, right? 
this spread is also much less exposed to time decay. So if you're a trader that um, you know doesn't like to be in longer dated options because you're worried about time decay, well, this is the type of position that you would want to be in, right? It's much less exposed to time decay. It's a low risk position with a huge potential upside, and it has exposure in GE from now until the end of January of 2017. Now, that type of trading allows me to put more capital into it, right? Let me ask you guys this. What do you think is the riskier trade, a $200,000 bet in weekly options or a $2 million bet in January of 2017 options? Which has more risk? Which has more risk? It's kind of a trick question, I guess. But which of these positions is more risky? Right, the weeklies. Right, most of you got that right. Most, most of you are saying the weeklies. It is the weeklies. Why are weekly options more risky? Well, it's $2 million. I'm betting 10 times as much money out to January, but it's much more risky to have 200000 in weeklies. Weeklies have more risk than longer dated options. They're higher reward potential and have explosive gamma, which means that they move a lot based on small moves in the underlying stock, and they have a lot more exposure to time decay. So, um, uh, you know, weekly options, the time decay looks like, you know, it looks like this. So it's very much exposed to time decay. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Chicago here this summer has been absolutely awful. It's been rainy and chilly like all month. <laughs> but um, uh, but if you're freaked out by options because you think that they have too much risk, well, guess what? They really they really don't. When you tweak your uh, trading plan and, and get in longer dated options, it doesn't necessarily have to be January of 2017. You don't have all the day to day risk of the weekly options or shorter dated options, right? They don't really move that much on a daily basis and they have a lot lower risk overall. That also means that I don't have to be in front of the screen and staring at this thing all of the time to manage it, right? I don't have to worry about my January 2017 options losing, you know, 50% of their value in, in a day, right? It doesn't happen that way. The stock would have to get absolutely crushed for that to happen, right? Absolutely crushed, okay? So think about it like this. You know, I don't personally trade too many of these longer dated strategies. Um, I do use longer dated unusual options activity as a guide for my investment account where I trade stocks. But if I trade with $100,000 in capital and I want to stay nimble, if I buy $5,000 worth of calls that expire in July, I can get out of them in one to two weeks. If I buy $5,000 worth of calls in January of 2017, I might have to hold on to them for nine to 12 months. So it ties up a lot of capital, but it's all about what type of trading you guys want to do. So, you know, I, I kind of try to keep like a balance of uh, longer date, you know, medium to uh, longer term dated options, but most of my risk is in short term options. Most people don't like that. And, you know, if you guys want to build a book that has longer dated positions, this is the way to go about doing it. All right, so I want to take as many questions as I can here. Um, before I do, I just want to tell you a little bit about what some of our customers have had to say about trading unusual options activity. Carol says, hey, I know I've said this at least a few times before that I've had my best day ever in KOTM. I sold 50 craft April 67 and a half calls for a massive, massive profit. I sold some at the open and the rest a few hours later. Bala says, hey, Keen, UOA is awesome. The trade hit that hit DRC, guess what? It made me 10 times my money. I invested. I bought 30 for 60 cents, sold for 6 bucks, and Matt, one of our most successful traders last year says, trading with KOTM has been very, very good to me. And he made over 1 million bucks last year trading unusual options activity. All right. So this stuff works, guys. It works because this is what the biggest traders in the world are doing to make money on a consistent basis. And we're able to find those trades and find those strategies. It's a lot easier than you guys might think. It's not as difficult. You can get access to this information. You can, you know, trade the same way as these institutional traders. So what we want to offer you now is a chance to come to our workshop that we are hosting next week 
called How to Choose Long-Term Trade Setups Using Unusual Options Activity. I just hosted um, uh, this workshop uh, uh, this past week, and it was three and a half hours long. So it's a ton of information. It's going to be live on June 25th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and we're only offering 25 spots at this price today. So it's going to be a huge discount. We're going to talk about how to trade options positions with holding periods between six months and one year, how to invest in longer term options, how to trade short term bottoms or tops in stocks with less risk using unusual options activity, how to avoid losing money in options via time decay by using a mix of credit and debit strategies, and an A to Z trading plan for swing trading these positions are going to teach you entries, stop losses, profit targets, and how to calculate and put those in the same way every single time so you never have a question about what you're supposed to do when you see an order like this hitting the tape. It's going to be a great plan for momentum names, and we're going to have an extensive, extensive live Q&A session after the presentation is over, and we're going to offer this to you guys today for $97, which is an 80% discount from our regular price. So I'm going to go ahead and put the link in here for you guys. I'm going to go ahead and put the link in here for you guys. So any questions that you guys have here, any questions that you guys have about the workshop, the um, uh, yes, the, the, it will be recorded. So if you cannot attend live on this date or you cannot be there for the whole thing, it will be recorded and you will be sent that recording and you will have access to it for life. You'll always have access to the recording. And we're going to stay there as long as it takes for me to answer all the questions that you guys have when we come to this workshop. right? I would imagine you're going to have a bunch of questions after a three-hour long presentation. But this is going to be on the 25th at 8. If you cannot come, you will be given access to the recording. Okay. So um, like always... Like always, we have a money-back guarantee on this. So if you come to the uh, workshop, you sit through the whole thing, you watch the recording, and you don't think you got $97 worth of value out of this out of this um, workshop, we don't want your $97, and we'll give you your money back. No questions asked. All right, if I could take a trade where if it didn't work out for me, I would get my money back in the end, I would do it literally every single time without even thinking about it. And that's exactly what I'm offering you guys now. If you came to this workshop today, you know, if you're here today, you obviously have some interest in trading and usual options activity. Come to the workshop, see what we have to teach you. It's so much more in depth. We can't, unfortunately, we can't cover this all in one hour. Come to the workshop, check it out. You guys are really, really going to like it. So someone says, um, um, I want to sign up, but I'm in a phone meeting with my board. <laughs> Please hold you a position. Okay, we will. Yeah, just make sure you, you make sure you write down this uh, link here, Eddie. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, options.thefloor.com/go is the link. So there's a lot of different scanners out there. Um, you can get. Uh, no, you do not need. You do not need to have any kind of special software. You can use um, uh, Thinkorswim to do this. This. Um, will uh, be something that you can use and uh, learn about without having access to our scanner. You don't need to have our scanner. That's Most of the questions that are coming across right now are about that. Now, the indicators that are applied, no, you don't need any special indicators either. All you need is the Ichimoku Cloud, and every platform has that. Every platform has that. So if you go and take a look here in um, Thinkorswim, there is a way to find this unusual options activity. Um, and just give me one second here. In Thinkorswim, uh, they have something called their Sizzle Index, and it's pretty easy. They've got something that you can just build right into this. If you click this little Sizzle button here, it automatically will load up the most unusual volume stocks for the day, and it'll rank them all here, and it gives you the top ten. It's pretty easy to, to, to do. And if I want to really focus on um, what's really great about this, too, is that I can come in and then also really, um, uh, where is it? I can come in here and set limits for things so I can filter this out even more. So I only want to see stuff that's three times the average daily volume. Well, boom, here is the list of, of the top 10 stocks that meet those parameters. And then what's great about the thinkorswim scanners is that I can then also look for sector-specific unusual options activity, right? So let's say I'm, I'm curious about, you know, what, what healthcare um, UOA has been happening recently. Well, boom, there's 16 stocks that had um, unusual options activity in the healthcare space on Friday, right? 
yes, Ichimoku is available for free on Thinkorswim. It is available for free on Thinkorswim. So I'm able to identify that. And then all I need to do is go into the time and sales in any given any given name, and I will be able to see the activity. So here's options, time, and sales, and boom, I can see BKD had some unusual options activity on Friday. A trader bought a thousand lot of the Oct 37 half calls for two dollars and twenty cents. That's a really big trade for BKD. Okay. So toss doesn't indicate if it's an open or close. If, if it's an open or closing position, but it does tell you everything else you need to know. And all you need to do is check the volume versus open interest, just like I just taught you how to do, right? And look, I absolutely know whether or not it was a buy or a sell. Look at this. Take a look at this. Um, uh, a thousand lot trades at 220. The market was $2 at 220. So they paid the offer. So this is a buy. This is a buy. I can identify it as a buy right away. And we're going to go over exactly all of this stuff in the workshop. Don't worry about that. Uh, I, TradeStation has some type of uh, sizzle index type of, of alert thing. I don't know exactly how it works. I don't use TradeStation personally. So, you know, I, I, I there's a lot of places to get this information as well, too. I mean, they it's written about a lot on uh you know, CNBC.com and other news outlets. Uh, Trade Alert has a scanner. Options Flux has um, a scanner as well. I don't really know what the prices of those are, but if you have Thinkorswim, you can get access to that information inside Thinkorswim. So, any other questions, guys? Any other questions? Feel free to ask away. Does your swing trade plan apply to regular trades in addition to UOA? I don't really know what a regular trade is. <laughs> I here's the thing. I don't want to. I don't want to take random trades. So I pretty much stick to unusual options activity. You will find that there's plenty of opportunities in UOA. You know why? If I think that the hedge funds have the best information, why wouldn't I want to just trade UOA? I trade earnings sometimes, and I, I do some day trades, but. I um, uh, pretty much stick to unusual options activity. Uh, do I use special parameters on the Ichimoku cloud? No, I do not. I use the standard default settings that come in any other um, uh, any any platform. It's the standard default settings. We don't tweak them. Uh, how long is the class? It really all depends on how many questions you guys have. I gave this uh, class earlier this week, and I we spent three hours and fifteen minutes. So it really kind of depends. I mean, I stay as long as it takes to answer all your guys' questions. And then you get the recording for it afterwards, too. What is the delta you are looking for when buyers of a one-year-out option? No, no, no. Okay, so there's no – if you're looking for a maximum level of implied volatility or a certain level of delta, you're trading completely backwards. Implied volatility is relative. Every stock has its own relative level of implied volatility that it trades at. So there's not a number that I can say is a high or low implied volatility. If anyone has ever told you that that's the case, you should run away from them screaming, right, because they don't know what they're talking about. <clears throat> if you follow unusual options activity, you I want to trade whatever the trade order that the trader is taking, right? They are doing this. They are, they are initiating the trade. I'm following their order flow. There's no such thing as too high of an implied volatility. There's no number that's a too high of an implied vol. Anyone who told you otherwise doesn't know what they're talking about. <clears throat> someone says, uh, typically how long does it take someone to come up to speed trading UOA, understanding uh, people have different trading backgrounds? Well, if you have a general understanding of options, it happens a lot faster, right? You know, um, a, I think that after you know taking the workshop, you're pretty much equipped to identify the orders right away. You know, as far as um, you know, trading them with the plan. If you follow the plan that we put in place, I think that you're you're pretty much ready to go right after you take the workshop. The best delta for a year out. That's that's not that's not a way. That's not how you trade options. There's not a, a certain delta that I'm looking for. The delta of these call spreads that they bought in GE was probably super low, but it's a it's a year and a half out at this point, right? When they put the trade on, it was 22 months until expiration, right? 
it's that's not how I want to trade. I'm not looking for specific deltas. Following unusual options activity identifies the lines of options that I want to trade. I, there's no analysis of delta that needs to be done. That's not how this works. It's a bad. It's a bad way to trade, to to look for hard hard and fast values for those for Greeks. It's just a terrible way to go about it. <clears throat> Am I saying that this trade is still viable in GE? Uh, well, here's the thing. The GE trade, is it still vi viable when I get into it now? No, I would not get into it now because it's 50% higher than it was when they initiated it, right? But one thing that's great about unusual option activity is once you identify that order, you can go through and basically say, okay, well, you know, I want to know if this trade is still viable you know, what can I look at to see if they still think that? Well, I can look to see if they're still in it. And looking at this, I mean, look, they're still in the trade. They haven't really exited. Um, uh, they haven't really exited much. There's still a uh, hundred and where'd it go? There's still 197,000 in open interest on the 30 line and 136,000 on the 35 line. So they're still in the vast majority of this position. They're still in the vast majority of this position. Have a good one, Ramesh. Yes, I'm trading the same options that are triggered by the unusual option activity order. That is that is my entry. That is my signal. That is the trade that I'm doing. How do you know if you're going to buy or sell a weekly or monthly option? Well, I, I do I do what the trader is doing, and we're going to talk about this in the workshop. You know, some trades that institutions do, I cannot follow because they're too risky. Institutions can take really risky positions if they want to. They can take on really risky positions if they want to um, because they have the capital to back that up, right? I'm going to tell you guys, teach you guys how to figure out whether or not a trade is, you know, quote, unquote, too risky based on the amount of capital that an institution is putting into it. And then I'm going to teach you how to, even if they're taking one of those trades that are too risky, um, uh, one of those trades that are, quote, unquote, too risky, how you can still use the information um, uh, to um, tweak it to a strategy that you might want to use. Someone says, is there a UOA in ETFs or um, in ETFs or in other things? Okay, so it doesn't really work quite as well in ETFs. It, ETFs, it depends on the ETF, okay? So, like, is there unusual option activity in, like, the, you know, uh, cybersecurity ETF? Yeah, that that there is. Is there unusual option activity in the SPY or the Qs? No. Right? Because once you start to look at stuff like that, like is there UOA in um, the, you know, like uh, currency ETFs or commodity ETFs? No, there's not. Because once you start to look at stuff like that, you're really, really raising the number of hedgers that come in and use options in those markets. So, you know, I don't want to, um, uh, I don't want to to be following UA in that. Here's the thing: it's like you can have insider information in, um, you know, Conagra, but does it's not like someone has insider information that the euro is going to do a hostile takeover of the yen, right? Or that Nat Gas is going to buy out crude oil, right? There isn't that type of activity that comes across, right? So it kind of takes away a big piece of the upside of that potential upside of there, you know, being some type of announcement or catalyst. And it also um, kind of uh, really raises the chance of uh, it have be it, have it being a hedge or it have been a hedge. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. It's it's just it's just like it's you can do it like you can look for a new drop option activity in it. Like you, I can look at the USO and see what options are trading. But here's the thing: like with commodities, everyone's a hedger, right? Most people are hedging. There's a lot of speculators too, but lo there's a lot of hedgers. Right. If I see ConAgra calls being bought, it's not like someone has a position in some other food stock and then is using ConAgra options to hedge. If I have a position in Apple, well, I might use options in the queues to hedge my Apple position. Right. So it becomes very difficult to read those types of trades. So we try to focus on it, and we say this all the time: the best unusual options activity comes across in a stock you've never heard of before. Right. Because that's the best. If I've never heard of a stock and I see unusual option activity and I get really excited. I get really excited if I see uh, UOA in a stock I've never heard I've never seen before.
I trade gaps after the move, so I'm looking to trade before the big move since it's the biggest ROI. Yeah, I mean that, and that's you know, U O A catches those moves. How many trades do you normally get into during a week? Well, it depends. Like on Friday, like on Friday, I bought some. I, I there was some more U O A in Conagra, and I I did a day trade that I bought some. Uh, I bought some uh, options um, in ConAgra for 95 cents and sold them at the end of the day for a dollar 45. Right? Then I, that was my only trade of the day on Friday. So it, it's kind of hard to say uh, exactly how many because it's driven by the institutions. Like on a holiday week, probably not very many at all. All the big traders are out in the Hamptons, right? So like the weekend of the week of Fourth of July when we have that Friday off, I probably will get into like no trades. But then when they come back, probably more. Right. It really kind of depends on what's going on in the market. In a week when there's a catalyst coming up, there's more opportunities. In a week where it's quieter, there's less. And it really, it's up to you, right? You, you can determine how many you get into during the week because there's always going to be signals. So any other questions, guys? Any other questions? I think after this, uh, I'm going to head down Lakeshore Drive to the W Hotel. I'm... Uh, and uh, catch a little bit of brunch action on a wonderful Saturday. So someone says, Romele, <clears throat> what if it's a pump and dump scam on a stock? These are usually done in penny stocks, but with some optionable companies under the radar, can it be easily manipulate? Can it, it and it can be easily manipulated in the options market? Okay, so I don't think that. But that happens really. Um, uh, no, no. I we're not going to talk about deltas once in the workshop. I, deltas have nothing to do with this. Nothing to do with this. Yeah. Oh, we're going to have a huge Q and A session after the workshop. So back back to your question there, uh, Fader. Um, here's the thing. When a trader comes in and buys an enormous block of options into something that's thinly traded they don't do it to try and do like a pump and dump. It doesn't really work that way, right? Because as soon as they do that, they jack up the implied volatility of that line of options. And, you know, if there was no size there for them to buy, if they, you know, if it rips higher if on implied volatility, it's like there's going to be a bid there for them to hit and get out. It doesn't really work that way. It's, it's not really something that they do. Like they do it in penny stocks. They can 100% do it in penny stocks, just like you said, but it doesn't really work in the options market. Yeah. Because here's the thing. The options market, it gets to a point where a trader is too big for the market, right? So they can't just keep like, like keep on piling in again and again and again. Like the market makers are more savvy. They, they know what's going on, right? They make they make sure that that stuff doesn't happen. There's never enough size there for them to do that. Uh, I can give you my email. James Akeen on the market .com. If you have any other questions, feel free to shoot me an email. I probably won't. I'm. Uh, answer until uh, <laughs> Monday, but feel free to ask. Alrighty, guys, so I'm going to put the link in here one more time, and then I'm going to say goodbye to all of you. Uh, yeah, if you, yeah, you get the slides. You get the recording of the co workshop and the slides. You get everything. You get it all. Alrighty. So everybody, have a fantastic rest of your weekend. I can't believe it's 10 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday right now. It feels so much later. It's, it's dark outside here already in Chicago. The clouds are everywhere. Um, so I will see all of you later on. Everybody have a 